Welcome to the Bulletproof Screenplay Podcast, episode number seven. The work never matches the dream of perfection the artist has to start with. William Faulkner. Broadcasting from a dark, windowless room in Hollywood, when we really should be working on that next draft, it's the Bulletproof Screenplay Podcast, showing you the craft and business of screenwriting while teaching you how to make your screenplay bulletproof. And here's your host, Alex Ferrari. Welcome to another episode of the Bulletproof Screenplay Podcast. I am your humble host, Alex Ferrari. Now, today's show is sponsored by Bulletproof Script Coverage. Now, unlike other script coverage services, Bulletproof Script Coverage actually focuses on the kind of project you are and the goals of the project you are. So we actually break it down by three categories, micro-budget, indie film market, and studio film. There's no reason to get coverage from a reader that's used to reading tentpole movies when your movie's going to be done for $100,000. And we wanted to focus on that at Bulletproof Script Coverage. Our readers have worked with Marvel Studios, CAA, WME, NBC, HBO, Disney, Scott Free, Warner Brothers, The Blacklist, and many, many more. So if you need your screenplay or TV script covered by professional readers, head on over to CoverMyScreenplay.com. Now, after speaking to so many screenwriters out there, I know and I've heard so many times that they want to learn how to produce their own screenplays. They want to produce their own work and have no idea how to do it. Well, I wanted to let you guys know that I just launched a brand new game-changing producing course called the Indie Film Producing Masterclass with award-winning indie film producer Suzanne Lyons. Now, the masterclass focuses on $1 million and below budgets, but all the things you learn there can easily be translated to $100 million if need be. So if you want to learn how to produce your own material, just head over to producingmasterclass.com. Now, today on the show, we have an emotions expert. His name is Carl Iglesias. He's a best-selling author and a master lecturer around the world, and he really focuses on the emotional impact of writing and, and getting the most emotion out of the words that are being put on the page. I've read all his books and taken a few of his courses, and he's wonderful and really made me start thinking differently about how I write, what kind of words you use to just pull out that emotion to really get the reader really excited about what they're reading. So I wanted to bring him on the show. And this episode, I beat him up something fierce. It's literally kind of like a free masterclass on screenwriting and emotional impact of your characters and story. And he even told me afterwards, he's like, my God, you you really beat me up in this episode. I'm like, yeah, I wanted to get as much stuff out for uh, screenwriters as humanly possible. So please get ready to take some detailed notes as we drop some major knowledge bombs in this episode. So without any further ado, enjoy my conversation with Carl Iglesias. Welcome, Carl. Thank you so much for being on the show. Yeah, thank you. My pleasure. So we'll jump right into it. So um, uh, what is um, your teachings are focused on uh, the emotional impacts of stories and screenplays. Can you explain this a little bit to the audience? Uh, sure. So um, uh, I was a, I was a writer. I'm still a writer, uh, and um, and I tend to be kind of very left brain. Uh, my wife likes to say that I have uh, two left brains. Uh, very very mostly logical, and, and and the thing that drives me more is is the uh, try to understand how things work. So uh, I've always wanted to tell stories. I always wanted to be in filmmaking, um, and and I wanted to know why. You know, you read all the books and it tells you, okay, you need to do this, you need to do that, three X structure, character development, character arcs, and everything that been that was being taught. I was wanting to know why, and, and and so I started to get more into the effect of storytelling more than the rules, and it, and it really did, didn't take long to understand why I was loving certain films more than others. And it was basically about the emotional response that I was getting from these films. You know, I tend I tend to like, uh, you know, comedies or thrillers. And I realized, well, a comedy that doesn't make you laugh is not is not never going to be your favorite movie. Or a horror film that doesn't scare you is not going to be your favorite horror film. So it's really all about the emotions uh, and response of the movies. And so I tend I kind of went you know with reverse engineering, figure out okay, the effect, the end effect is the emotion, the emotional response of the audience. Mm -hmm. And so how do you get there? How do you do that? And that's what I tend to focus in my studies and 
in my teaching. Um, you know, it's the kind of, you know, as people say, it's the kind of book that uh, you always wanted to read, but uh, uh, couldn't find out there. So you wrote it. Um, and <laughs> right. that's, that's what it is. You know, so I, I wrote that. And, I'm, uh, you know, as far as I know, I'm the only one who speaks about this. And I think it's the most important thing. Um, you know, if, if uh, you know, when people read your script, if they don't, if they're not engaged by your script, then you lost. That's it. There's, it doesn't even go past the past the reader to the executives, let alone to actors and directors and, you know, uh, the studio uh, betting, you know, $100 million to make your film if it doesn't engage them. So so the rule number one and the only rule in, in storytelling is to engage the audience and not be boring. And that's really, you know, I like to say in my classes that there's only, you know, there's, there's, there's thousands and thousands of rules and principles from all the books, but, and you can break all of them. Mm -hmm. uh, except one, you cannot break this one rule, which is be interesting. And as long as you're interesting, you can break any rule you want. And I think you'll still be a good storyteller, but that's the key. You got to engage your audience. And, and so, uh, so I focus more on the actual specific techniques that generate those, uh, emotional responses. So with that said, I'm going to, I'm going to put you on the spot a little bit. And one sure. of my, my favorite films of all time, and arguably now, according to IMDb, the number one film of all time, mm -hmm. The Shawshank Redemption. Okay. Yeah. Great film. It is, it's absolutely amazing. And I've analyzed that movie so much because mm -hmm. I've, I've wondered what, what is in that film? story and in the way that Frank Darabont wrote that story and also mm -hmm. directed and the characters and the actors and right. the, the whole package. But what's in that movie that touches so many people? I mean, like mm -hmm. in a way that I, there's never been another movie that I know right. that when it came out, it wasn't like this blowout success. Obviously it was not, it did get nominated for a best picture, but it didn't win. But, right. but it's one of those movies that kind of grew later. And until, mm -hmm. till now all of a sudden it kind of just came yes. up and took over the Godfather. Like, you know, absolutely. Who, you know, yeah. the, when the Godfather came out, it blew everything out of the water. Everybody yeah. knew it was the greatest thing ever made at that right. time. But Shawshank didn't. And I'm mm -hmm. curious on your take of why that story hits so beautifully with everybody. Well, there, I think there's two combinations. First of all, uh, and you're right, when the movie first came out, it wasn't a success at all. And and the thing that makes a movie a success usually from the start, which is the beginning, is usually the concept. Mm -hmm. So the concept <laughs> is like the book cover, right? There's right. something about the concept that's unique. Uh, that drives people to the theaters. Not a great concept. <laughs> uh, not a great concept at all, right? It actually kept people away. It's like, okay, a movie about people in prison, or who cares? You know, who cares? I, in the, I, in I mean, the I was, 30s, right? I, I'll admit, I was one of them. You know, it's like, that movie does not interest me. Right. And it was only through word of mouth and reviews, and, and, and then you finally go, okay, I'll go see it, and then you're wowed by it. So when you're in the theater... So, you know, when you're trying to make a, when you're trying to write a story, I always recommend, you know, since, since you're not, you, you know, you're, I would say you're, you're a nobody and you want to interest people, you got to do it with a concept first. So at least people open your script and read it. Mm -hmm. But, um, in this case you had, uh, it was simply word of mouth. So what is it about once you're inside the theater, once you're committed to watching these two, this film, what is it that that wows you? So the very first thing is always characters. That the first thing is, is is a character that you connect with, and the very first thing that they connect you with is is Andy and a character who is unjustly accused of something that he didn't do, and that automatically connects you. So if you're familiar with the um, you know, my techniques for, uh, for connecting emotionally with a character, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the, the, one of the most powerful one is pity. So feeling sorry for someone and you automatically feel sorry for him because he, he didn't do, you know, he's accused of something and he's accused for, I guess his uh, life, right. Mm -hmm. Uh, for, for something that he didn't do. So this, uh, un, undeserved misfortune is one of the biggest, biggest, uh, techniques you can use to connect with a character. And so you're automatically connected. So you're already on board. And then you realize, okay, well, you know, what do you do when you're inside a prison? I mean, inside, uh, you know, the only thing you can do to survive is hope. And hope is probably one of the most powerful uh, themes and messages in stories. That's true. Uh, you know, because all of us in our lives, our lives are struggle. Mm-hmm. And and especially in the movie business, uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, but if you look at you look at uh, you know great stories and and certainly the foundation of most religions is is hope. 
uh, you know, it's, it's one of the most powerful things. So you've got a character we care about. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. Um, uh, you know, uh, combined with this message of hope, you know, uh, you know, get busy living uh, or get busy dying, great, which is great. such a powerful oh, line, right? Oh, amazing. Um, and th- there you go. And then, of course, you know, you got you got to tell a good story. So there's elements of suspense, there's a tension, anticipation, surprise, humor, uh, other characters you care about. Um, yeah, red. You know, certainly fear. Uh, uh, you know, once you're uh, once you're connected with a character, what you what you do as a storyteller is you're trying to make us worry about that character. You know, you hope that they will be uh, happy, and you hope that they'll survive or what they do whatever they want. Uh, the interesting about this 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 movie though is that we didn't know what Andy, you know his you know his goal was secret for 19 years, and and so uh, we didn't really know what what his main goal was other than surviving. But if you create jeopardy for that character throughout, and they certainly do in, in this in this film, uh, you're worried all the time, and so you're com- constantly engaged uh, in in this film. So you have you have the character you care about, you have the struggle, and then of course the the, the big you know uh, epiphany and 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 the way everything is resolved, which is very clever, surprising. Uh, oh, yeah. you know, poetic justice at the end. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's just, and friendship. I mean, it's got, uh, you know, everything is there. You got all the, the great ingredients. And then of course you got to, you know, uh, give kudos to Stephen King for the story and for, for Darabont for the adaptation. But it's just one of those, one of those things where everything, all the stars are aligned and, you know, with great, great characters and with performances and, uh, you know, a great script. I mean, yeah, it's definitely one of the, one of the greatest movies out there. And then uh, Darabon, I heard he literally gave the movie, the script away to get the opportunity to direct it. Uh, yeah, yeah, because yeah. he was he was offered a few million. Because people who read it in the business understood that that w- this was like, oh, this is serious. This is a good mm-hmm. script. Yeah, but he they offered him like seven figures, like high, like mid to high seven figures for it, and he's like, nope. He finally he wanted I think, to direct it. Huh? He wanted yeah. to direct, and he started yeah. his career. And I, was, yeah. I think it, I think it was a good idea for him. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. It's kind of like uh, Sylvester Stallone and Rocky oh, too. Yeah. yeah. Now, do you actually believe that Rocky was written in three days? <laughs> uh, <laughs> <laughs> he says he wrote it in three days. I it's mean, possible that he wrote it in three days, but he probably developed it over a longer period of time. Right. You know? And that's another great, I mean, geez, it, yeah. that, that, oh, absolutely. that script is the ultimate underdog story. Yeah. Um, so let me ask you a question. Why mm-hmm. is uh, Hollywood's, why is Hollywood lacking such emotion, true emotion in its films today? And why do they like... So, why do you why do you think because in, in the seventies and the eighties even there was more emotion and character uh mm. in their movies than today. Today it just seems to me so flat and so heavy yeah. reliant on visual effects and, and concepts and things that we've we've seen back from the seventies and eighties that they're rehashing today. Why yeah. do you what, what what do you think of the well, in the business today in general? It's well, I, you know, the business is always a sign of the times. It's mm-hmm. always, a, you know, a reflection of the culture, and and you know, our culture in the sixties and seventies was a lot different than it is today. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know, you got to understand that uh, the film studios are a business; they're corporations. They're in the they're in the business of making money. So uh, they're not in the business of making art. Um, it, it's one of those really interesting paradoxes uh, where uh, you know, I think in Europe they're more interested in making art. Because their their films are subsidized by the by the government, you know, mm-hmm. uh, but but in, in in the United States, it's all you know, it's 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 capitalism. So you basically go, okay, well, what is, who buys our films? Who are our films for? Who is our audience? What do they want? You know, and when you have a huge population of uh, you know uh, the fourteen fifteen year old boys who, who who go see the movies, that's why you have so many you know superhero. Uh, movies and and kind of like you know video game type movies and horror films and comedies and um, you know but that's the sign of times and and uh, you know once in a while you get you know a great movie that 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 goes across all uh, all demographics you know the four Q mm-hmm. movies uh, and then uh, you know then then try to make the same kind of movie and then people get bored it's one of those things I mean we're you know, one of the, one of the strongest emotions we have as an audience is is this sense of we always want something new, 
And and when we get the same thing over and over and over, we mm-hmm. eventually get tired of it. Mm-hmm. And then we gravitate and then we gravitate onto this new thing. So you always get those. In in, in 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 movies, you always get that one film that just 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 you know the sli- the sleeper hit, basically. Right. And and then everybody wants to make it, you know. And then they beat so, and they beat it to death. And they beat it to death, and then you try something new. The thing that really, really surprises me uh still is, is this um you know, it's the superhero movies yeah, that the comic keep book. going on and on and that, that have been, you know, slated for release until, you know, 2020, which is unbelievable. It just, they have such a, uh, you know, a high confidence uh, in movies. And, and I'm kind of surprised that there has, you know, there's so much saturation. I'm, kind of, I'm surprised that they, uh, the audience hasn't tired of it. but And now know. and now Warner Brothers is getting into it and now they're going mm-hmm. to bring all their slates out. So yeah, I'm a, I'm a, yeah, I'm wondering about how much longer. I'm a comic book geek, so I've, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm happy about it. But right. at a certain point, uh, I, you know, now they're going to be doing Star Wars every year. Right, right. In, until a foreseeable future, you know, right. it's, so it's... Well, the thing is, I mean, as long as you tell a good story, um, that's what counts. I mean, that's what counts. So, so if you can, as long as you can maintain uh, great storytelling mm-hmm. within that con- within that concept and that genre, then I think you're okay. Uh, I think so far they're doing okay. You know, I mean, I mean, comic books have been, you know, yeah, I've been in business for you know uh, over eighty years, I think, and Something so like that, it's yeah. like, uh, yeah, uh, and and they're still in business. So you know, as, as long as you maintain good storytelling and characters, yeah, absolutely. So, um, what are the biggest mistakes you see in first-time screenwriters? Ooh, <laughs> <laughs> I know it's, it's a short it's a short show, but just yeah. try to condense it a little bit. I was gonna say, how long do you have? Uh, probably <laughs> the, the top, biggest the mistake. Five, yeah. uh, the biggest mistake. Do you, well, the biggest mistake is is um, I think over relying on plot over character. That's one, um, and, and so you tend to have flat characters. Um, another big mistake I see, uh, you know, dialogue usually is, is pretty crappy. Uh, and that's usually the one thing that, that we kind of read most of, uh, in a script of you return to get the story from the characters, you know, and, and good dialogue usually reflects the character's personality. So, you, you know, um, uh, and and the fact that the script the scripts don't really amount to anything uh they don't really go anywhere go anywhere or they don't say anything they don't have any meaning we don't know what the characters what the author wanted to really say uh you know which is usually reflected in the character arcs um so uh, you know there's always a a reason for everything you know when they say like a, 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 a you know structure is another thing too we, everybody talks about structure but I, I don't think anybody understands what that means you know they think well three up structure beginning middle and end but they don't understand that the turning points that create that structure are are more about character than actually plot points you know they call they you know mm-hmm. Sid Phil used to call them plot points but so people think, well, it's got to be something big and that changes the story. It, it, it's not really that. It's more about the, the, the character mm-hmm. and the character decisions uh, and the character changes, uh, you know, and the epiphany of the character and what that means to the overall story. Uh, that's what that's what we're looking at. So we're talking about, I think, mostly a, uh, you know, kind of like there's a lot of there's a lot of education out there for scripts but i don't think it goes deep enough or i think people most most people don't really understand kind of like the deep 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 principles of story and how it relates to us as human beings which i think once you really understand that, that that's kind of like a it's 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 mostly what my my focus is at this uh, at this stage of my career is really kind of going deeper into story and and understanding why what it means and why we why we like stories or why we why story has such an effect on us emotionally. Mm-hmm. It's good to say well you know we enjoy stories and we you know like to feel suspense but why is that and I think once you understand that uh, it kind of teaches you that how to do it teaches you why you should do it and and and. To, you know, kind of makes you see when you don't have it in a, in a script to kind of really focus on it. You know. Now, did you happen? You happen to see uh, Straight Outta Compton yet? I haven't seen it yet. No. Uh, and I saw it. I saw it this last weekend, and mm-hmm. it's it's. Uh, I heard it was good. It's my. It's so far this year is probably the best film I've seen, which right. says a lot mm-hmm. about the industry today. Like a, a film right. about, about uh, a good storyteller, a good story about you know gangster rap is like right. the best story out there right now which wow. yeah. fasc- which fascinates me uh-huh. but it was good even my wife who had no idea about gangster rap she sat there and said that was a really good movie because right. of the character and the story which leads me to my next uh my next question 
Mm -hmm. Uh, There has been great debate about this question for many years, and I'd love to hear your thoughts about it. Um, What, in your opinion, is more important, plot or character? (laughs) (laughs) Well, uh, that is a very good question. Um... We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. Yeah, well, you probably heard, I mean, you heard this before, uh, you know, right, you, you get both ends, right? But uh, most people tend to lean toward character. And the reason for that is because you will, you will hear that character creates plot. Uh, you know, the, the, the more, since, since we need to connect with character and since we tend to appreciate more three-dimensional characters, uh, you know, you can't really kind of have just a plot that's already ready-made uh, and trying to fit characters in it because the end result will be flat characters. Um, so characters tend to have the edge, but here's my point on it. My, here's my view on it. Stories are neither plot driven nor character driven. Okay. Okay. So that, that's going to be probably kind of the controversial thing to say. You think it's one of the other, but it's neither. What I like to say is that stories are tension driven. Okay. So it's not prompt to character. It's tension that grabs an audience that makes you appreciate a story and tension is really you know a problem that needs to be solved um or a character that needs to change okay um so you know you could have you need tension at the story level to keep us it's the only thing that keeps us engaged basically Mm -hmm. when when i talk about all the emotions of story and i talk about the audience emotions not the character emotions so you have for example you have character emotions like you know uh, you know, sadness and joy and fear. Mm-hmm. Uh, when I'm talking about the audience emotions, the emotions you pay money to go see in the theaters, we're talking about curiosity, anticipation, tension, hope, worry, surprise, laughter, right? Those are the emotions you like to feel in, uh, as an audience. Mm-hmm. And all of these could be encompassed in, like, into that one umbrella of tension, in other words, when you're feeling tension in a story, there's no way you're bored. You're completely engaged when you're feeling tension. So that's really the key emotions you want to feel. Now, tension and, and tension in, yeah. in what's it like tension, any kind of tension or comedic tension or romantic Well, tension? it's all tension. It's all tension. And tension basically me it's basically to me it's the opposite of boredom, basically. Okay. You know, you like if you're engaged. bored passively sitting back in your seat and you're going, uh, you know, you think about something else. When you're feeling, for example, if, if somebody creates a, a question on the set, you see a character enter a room, the very first thing that goes in your mind is who is this character, right? So why are they in the room? What are they doing? Where are we? So all these questions, when you first start a movie, that creates curiosity, right? So curiosity, that sense of curiosity in your brain is tension, mm-hmm. right? Because you have this question. When that question gets answered, you have tension relief, Okay. Okay. And everything, you know, everything that's enjoyable about life is tension relief, basically. Right. I mean, when you're, you know, when you're, when you're having, you know, you want to have sex with someone, you you have this, you know, you have tension and it gets, it gets released at the end when you have, uh, you know, when you're hungry, that's tension. You eat, you know, you have to, you feel satisfied, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, You're tired, that's tension. You go to sleep, you feel relief. So it's all about uh, tension relief. Excuse me for a second. (laughs) (laughs) Um, And so, so it's all about tension. So all these, you know, when you feel anticipation, you know, like the character says, okay, I'm, uh, I'm going to go and, you know, to, and then you should go to Europe to catch a killer, right? So when you say, I'm going to Europe, so you anticipate. Mm -hmm. The, the arrival to or uh you know uh, meet me meet me in the parking lot so i'm going to beat you up later after school oh, yeah. that's anticipation so that's tension anticipation is tension curiosity is tension um you know and is she, la- she going to kiss me or not or exactly they, yeah, yeah, yeah in a scene so even yeah. so when you go deeper right you you all know that you know storytelling is or filmmaking is all scenes right so at the scene level uh, that's another thing too. That when you're talking about um, what's really uh, doesn't work in scripts, it's mostly scenes. So I, I tend to teach a lot of classes on on scene writing because I think it's at the scene level, you know, that that, that counts. And scenes are really mini stories. So you have a character who wants something in the scene and is having difficulty getting it, and that's what creates tension in the scene because you want well, will they get it? And that's what drives the scene. That's what drives the whole story. If you have a main tension in the story, um, 
And and really, all when you think about it, all stories are just tension until they are relief, until you have a resolution, right? You have a you, have, you know the, the the three X structure people three X structure people like to say that it's you know beginning, middle, and end, but I like to say it's mostly uh, you know set up, struggle, and resolution, right? And the mm-hmm. struggle is that middle act two, which is the, the struggle to get what they want. And in a lot of scripts, you see characters first of all that you don't know what they want. That hasn't been thought of, so that's already broken right there. Mm-hmm. And if we know what they want, usually it's 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 not that difficult. So you so it's not that interesting. So there's no struggle. Um, and so there you go. That's that's my answer. So it's all about <laughs> tension. <laughs> okay, there it is. Then yeah, we've put the, we put the end to the debate right now. Yes, well, <laughs> this is just according to me all. Of course. Yeah. So um. In your opinion, what is the functions of dialogue? The functions of dialogue, uh, boy, you have like really big, big questions here. Like, I, I'm, I'm, I'm whole trying. Class to 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 answer those. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. I'll I'll start throwing some more softer questions. <laughs> uh, well, the functions of dialogue. I mean, uh, there's only two ways you can uh, tell a story. Really, you can you can um, you know you you can describe something right mm-hmm. so and then you could you you can have characters talking about it right mm-hmm. so the, the the difference between the two is that traditionally the the narrative part of it is more passive and the dialogue is more active meaning that when characters speak in dialogue you are immersed in the experience you're you're there with them you're like a fly on the wall like really kind of being part of the conversation. And that's usually, in your brain, that's usually more interesting than just reading. You know, if I told you, you know, uh, Bob entered the room and said to Susie uh, that he loved her and that he couldn't live without her. Mm -hmm. So I'm just kind of describing something, right? So I'm just telling you a little story. But if I say, you know, Bob came into the room and and he goes, Susie, I love you. I I can't live without you. And Susie says, well, sorry, I don't love you back. I'm seeing your, your best friend or whatever, right? <laughs> right? So, you know, by by actually having the character speak, uh, you're, you're a lot more immersed. It's, a lot, it's more of an active experience than just uh, description. And usually readers, you know, when they read scripts, and they read tons of scripts, they usually tend to just read dialogue only. They're trying to grasp the story because they have to read a script so fast, so they... I like to say that they, oh, they read verti- they read vertically. Most most readers, at least you know, the ones that I know of from experience, uh, because they have to read scripts very fast, um, and so they usually get the story from the dialogue. So uh, you know, when you see scripts with a lot of description, it's, it, they usually don't tend to like that. It takes them longer to read it. it takes them longer to understand mm-hmm. the story. Um, and also, the great thing about dialogue is that uh, not only you can communicate the story. You can also communicate the characters' personalities and attitudes, so you get to get to really get to learn the characters. Um, and also, dialogue tends to be the joy of of <laughs> the you know the the wit and cleverness and sarcasm and of of, of a story you know of characters. Now, with dialogue, I, I, I would argue to say one of the greatest dialogue writers alive today is um, Quentin Tarantino. Mm-hmm. Sure. Um, what? Um, what is your take on his style, which is so unique that mm-hmm. I mean, I, I've tell I tell people all the time, like there are certain directors, certain writers that might have not made it in this market, this time or that time. But mm-hmm. honestly, I think if Tarantino shows up today with Reservoir Dogs, it it it, it would it would create a revolution just because uh-huh. of who he is and his talent. Absolutely. What, what is yeah. what is your take on his? technique and how he does his things because they are it's such a unique person and i always tell uh, filmmakers if you want to learn how to write dialogue Mm -hmm. listen to his dialogue don't try to write his dialogue because you'll never be able to right right but well there's well the thing about tarantino i mean first of all he he is a extremely knowledgeable about film you know he used used to work as a, a in a video store and he used to like pretty much immerse himself in movies and and even really obscure movies, you know, and foreign films and, and uh, Hong Kong films and mm-hmm. uh, crime films. Um, so he's very knowledgeable. So he's able to ask, actually, you know, uh, my, my belief in of art or creativity is really, creativity is really a, a way of combining old things into something new, 
Mm -hmm. And this is what he does. So the more old things you know, the more you're, you, the more resources you have, which is this knowledge of film, the more you can combine them into something unique. And that's what he does very well. Um, so that's that. Two is that he's not afraid to break the rules. Oh, yeah. And like I said, like I use Tarantino all the time in examples of when I say that you can break every rule except one and be interesting. And that's that's the one. That's, <laughs> he's, he, that's what he does. I mean, he breaks every single rule except one. He's always interesting. And that's why he's successful, because people people gravitate to his films because they know they're not going to be bored. Right. And so you if know? you watch so if you watch Pulp Fiction, which mm -hmm. the structure of that film is right. is non obviously not standard right but if you look at the plot points they yeah. actually hit yeah well which is, you know which is kind of weird we'll be right back after a word from our sponsor and now back to the show Absolutely. Well, yeah. Well, it's like, um, uh, you know, the, the French filmmaker Jean-Luc Godard is known, mm -hmm. is known for to have said, you know, uh, every every film has a beginning, middle and end, not necessarily in that order. <laughs> right. right. So right. That, when you if you, you can put Pulp Fiction in the order of the story, it's just uh, it he cool. decided to tell it in a in, in a just nonlinear way. You know, uh, he just played with time a little bit, um, you know. And it blew, and it just yeah and obviously yeah it was very happened. unique absolutely and, and entertaining which is the most important thing I mean you know uh, you know I, I've seen films where people tried experimenting with things but they were just boring as hell you know right right and in this case he experimented and and it turned out okay because it was interesting you know he he still told the story with interesting characters and surprises. So um, you wrote a book called uh, "101 Habits of Highly Successful Screenwriters." Mm -hmm. uh, can you share a few of those habits with the audience? Some mm. of the some of the top ones that you think that are, are really important. Well, the very very top one mm -hmm. is the one that started it. That's that led to the writing for emotional impact, which was uh, habit number sixty nine, which was uh, evoking emotion on the page. And so one of those habits was, uh, you know, it. it, it successful writers are success are successful because they're able to evoke an emotion on the page consistently mm -hmm. right so they're able to create that emotional response in the reader they're always entertaining uh so they're masters of their craft and um and when i started teaching uh because of that book I, at the time i was just a writer and i, I was I had no interest in teaching i was <laughs> just a writer i just wanted to be alone in in my room right <laughs> so i was completely terrified but i was invited to the very first uh, screenwriting expo and uh, because of that, that those habits book uh, the book mm -hmm. and uh the thing that most people wanted to know was of, was of course this particular habit which is the craft they all wanted to know about the craft so i started teaching about the that part of it uh and then people eventually wanted to wanted to have a book, and that's the reason why the the second book was written because people just kept asking, you know, from after my presentation. So, is there a book with all that information that I was giving? Um, so, but in terms of habits, there's so the, that's the number one by far. I mean, you could you you could like I said, you could ignore any other habit if you, if you consistently are able to create an emotional response in the reader mm -hmm. from your words, you're guaranteed success. Um, because, you know, you can just, you know, you can drop your script in the middle of a Beverly Hills park and, you know, an agent will pick that up and read it. And if they're totally wowed by that script, there's no way he's not going to pick up the phone and call you. Um, but that's the key. They have to be wowed by the script and, and 99% of the scripts out there are not that, you know, that great, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's why there's so much, uh, problems. Um, but, um, the other thing too, and this is more about the business aspect of it is that one of the habits is that you you, 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 sh you have to have, you have to develop a really thick skin <clears throat> in Hollywood because most of the business is rejection. So you have to be able to be able to take rejection and be able to live with it and be able to persevere and keep writing and keep getting better and keep having hope, you know? Mm -hmm. Oh, Tarantino took forever. For him yeah, to even and a lot of people do. Uh, one of the one of the uh, you know surprising things when I was interviewing all those writers was that their very first script that they sold was usually their tenth or more. You mm -hmm. know that they kept they kept writing even though they kept being rejected and not selling anything and and having to you know work crappy jobs or even not having any money in the bank and struggling. 
but they just kept at it. And I think a lot of writers, even very talented writers who could be great writers, usually because of life and family and, uh, mm-hmm. you know, um, usually give up because, because of the realities of life and don't have that persistence and that passion to, uh, to keep writing. You know, it, I think writers are one of the most undervalued, um, parts of the filmmaking process. Oh, I mean, absolutely. Yeah. It, it is all part. I mean, it starts on the page. Uh huh. Yeah. Yeah. It starts. And they're, the they're really the most important element. I mean, when you think about it, without the writer, if there's no script, nobody in this town has a bit, has a job. Right. Right. I mean, as, think as, about all the jobs in this industry, right? There's over 200, 300 jobs that are related to making a film. If not more. Right. If not more. And, and we're not talking about just the film. We're talking about, you know, the business. Oh, and yeah, the, yeah. Uh, the agents way- and producers and and accountants and lawyers. I mean, if without a script, nobody has a job. As 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 Hollywood realizes every time there's a writer's guild strike. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> All of a sudden, everyone goes, "Oh, wait a minute, we need these guys." Right. Exactly. <laughs> Maybe we should pay them a little bit but here, more. But that's the that's that is the paradox that they, you know, they they know secretly that they're the most important, but they think that they could do it. They think that it's not that hard that anybody can do it oh, that's anyone, the problem. well that's the thing and you, if i've seen a movie so i could write one it's kind of like and if everyone says that and then i'm like well you could also listen to a symphony doesn't mean you can write one and right. it's yeah, exactly uh, yeah, it, it, yeah. Hey, it's a lot more than just that um, this, is, this is old joke that i like to say about this guy who's uh, who goes to a piano store and 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 he's he, he goes inside the piano store as his old man he sits down and starts playing the piano and he's awful <laughs> and and the the salesman goes, what, what, what's going on? What what are you thinking? He says, well, I, I I can't understand this. I've been listening to music my whole life. <laughs> <laughs> Why doesn't it work? I don't know. Right, exactly. <laughs> right. So that's the thing. People think that you know because they because we immersed in films because we see movies all the time. We we know how they work and everything. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's like telling a joke too. Some people you know uh, some people everybody understands jokes and appreciates jokes, but uh, nobody can be a comedian. You know. Ooh, it's it's rough to be up on that stage. <laughs> no, no question about it. Yeah. Um. So, what are some of the mistakes you see in uh, indie film stories and in their screenplays in general? Because I know they're very kind of different than your mainstream movies. So yes, indie films, I find a lot of times when they hit, they're wonderful. But the majority yeah. of them are, you know, a little rough sometimes. Yeah. What's um, your experience with that? Well, my, my experience with them is that um, it, 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 as it's not going to be surprising me to, for me to say, it's, worth, it's again, the emotional response. So, mm-hmm. you know, when you say if an indie film doesn't hit – that's basically what it means. It means it just didn't grab the audience. The audience was mostly bored by it. Mm. Uh, so, you know, there's always good elements in an indie film that, that, that makes the people on, on board to, to commit to it and make it. And usually it's about characters. Mm. Uh, the thing about indie hits is that most of them, as far from my experience, don't really have a concept. You know, it's mostly a very soft concept and it's really kind of relies on character and the drama of characters. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, you know, great. The characters are great, but, but ultimately if the audience is bored throughout, in other words, if the other elements, the other emotions are ignored, you know, like, like tension or surprise or twists or, mm-hmm. uh, you know, something unique about it, you know, um, they just don't grab the audience, you know, or maybe it's the, maybe it's the, the statement that the, the, you know, the filmmaker wants to make, maybe it's a statement that we just don't care about. Right. You know, I mean, <laughs> that there's, happens. There's, there's a lot of things, you know. So can you give an example of a few indie films that blew you away and why they blew you away? Oh, it's been, uh, and it's been a while. Yeah, it's been a while. Yeah. <laughs> you can go back and go back to the That's early nineties. You mean, can go back to the um, early nineties if you have. Yeah. To. <laughs> for me, I mean, the type of movies that I tend to like are, are more, I, I like, you know, more thought provoking films. So I, t- I tend to gravitate towards the, you know, sci-fi and, and futuristic, not, not necessarily fantasy, but, mm-hmm. but so the movies like, you know, like stranger than fiction, for example. Yeah. Uh, well, so anything that has a really kind of like a really very unique concept to it, well, but, ad- but it's definitely an indie film. Right. Um, mm-hmm. you know, uh, I, I usually tend to like it because I'm, because I'm more, intellectually challenged or, uh, you know, like my mind is constantly working and thinking and, you know, I tend to have more of a philosophical kind of mind thing. So anything that has a really kind of high concept mm-hmm. within the indie film, tend, I tend to like, uh, uh, I'm trying to think of the last, 
the last one. Memento, was, Memento was a pretty. Oh, Memento, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. That was one of those ones. I mean, obviously, Reservoir Dogs and. Right. And yeah. those, Pulp those, Fiction. Pulp Fiction, which uh, was kind of an indie, but yeah. 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 Uh, uh, yeah uh, you know, very, very old film, but uh, 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 Mariachi. But, oh, Robert, yeah. Robert Rodriguez, you know, that he made a very indie, right? Only yeah. made it only $7,000, but there, there was something really unique about it and, and it was entertaining. Mm hmm. Um, We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. So, so high concept, good characters, but also great, you know, a, a good story there that really keeps you engaged from start to finish. One, one film I, I think that, I, I don't know if you liked it, and I think you might have, Adaptation? Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, that was a very interesting I liked take. it, yeah. Uh, it was an interesting take. And of course, we all enjoyed it because we were writers and we could, yeah. we, we could, we could identify. <laughs> oh, bad, could we? Yeah, but you know what? I didn't, I didn't like it as much as I enjoyed Eternal Sunshine because oh, yeah, yeah. You know, Eternal Sunshine had this really high concept. Mm -hmm. So this is a good example from the very, very same filmmaker. Uh, a very you know. unique filmmaker. Uh, exactly, yeah. Oh, God, I forgot his name. Charlie Kaufman. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, although if you're talking about the Spike Jones as the director, yeah. Spike and speaking of Spike Jones, yeah. uh, her too was a, was a good indie film. Yeah, that, that was a really concept. good film. Yeah, very very nice film. I like that one a lot as well. Right. Um, is there any um, any advice you can give indie filmmakers on writing their first script, other than what we've already kind of discussed? Any specific like techniques or tools that maybe that could help them to kind of get off the ground? Uh, just just learn more about story. Mm -hmm. uh, and 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 we're not talking about just the you know the usual the usual suspects of you know, <laughs> the books and McKee and Sidfield. Uh, we're talking about just go deeper into into story and how to tell a really good one. Uh, I think there's there's still a lot of people that don't know how to tell a good story. Um, and and of course it starts with the emotion. So obviously I would tell people go read my book or, you know, of course, of course. Uh, and, and learn that it's really about the emotions and, and that you could break every single rule as long as people feel those emotions. So learning, learning how to write scenes, uh, that would be another aspect of it. Learn how to write a good scene. Um, I always tell writers to take acting classes because, um, even if they're not interested in being an actor, because you get to learn how to write good scenes from, uh, from actors. Mm -hmm. Because that's you know they're all they're all you know their main thing is is what do I want in the scene and and the different beats in the scene and that's really how you write a good scene. Um, that's interesting. That's a really good. Yeah. That's a really good tip. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, and that, but learn how to how to create that feeling. Really knowing what an audience wants out of a story, you know. So we definitely want something new. So we want something so probably a, a thought provoking concept. We want characters we can uh, connect with emotionally. So th there's actually techniques for that, mm -hmm. which I talk in the book. Um, and then once once we connect with a character, you know, give us give us a, uh, you know a a goal that that is worthy you know a lot, a lot of the times you know mm. a character goes after something that we you know it's it tends to be more of a selfish goal and we don't really connect with that uh this is this is something that i also speak about about the paradox of the goals we have in life which is to you know to be rich right <laughs> to, to, <laughs> sure. we, we all try to make money and survive mm -hmm. uh but you never see that in films you, you never see that as as a goal in film so say, uh, so say that again. Say that again. This is interesting. So okay. So there's this paradox of okay. If you if you think about it, if you ask people in real life what they're what do they aspire to, right? They right. usually aspire to have a good job, to be rich, to to be happy, to have things, to have material things, a big house, a good car, Scarface. Uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. Exactly. Scarface. Or to have power. Right. Right. Uh, well, power you see that in films, but usually it's the in the in the uh, cautionary tales, right? The sure. anti-hero. Sure. 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 But but in films, when you think about what is it that people aspire to in films, like what their goals are, it's usually about love, mm -hmm. about family, about saving the village, about doing something for another, about finding their child. You know, it's more about what's really important in life that people kind of still are trying to learn on their own. So there, there's the there's the connection between stories and the meaning of stories and why we like stories and what is the the power of stories in our life. Um, but do you think, do you think that a story that had the goal of being just 
rich or successful or comfortable and having a good family and which are most of the goals of of real life people. Right, right, right. Yeah. Do you think a story like that or do you have an example of a story? Well, like no, that? we don't. I mean, other than I mean, somebody brings uh, the uh, the example of how to succeed in business and never trying, which is a famous play. Uh-huh. But but you never see that, or or you see that in a character that originally goes after that goal, but then learns that's not the, you know, usually midpoint that mm-hmm. the, that's not the, the solution. Um, so yeah, so it, and there's a reason for that is because it doesn't work. It, oh, you know, okay. you know, it, it doesn't, uh, you know, and, and to go back to your question about the, the common errors I see in film is that usually the, 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 the goals um, that characters have in a story are usually not what I call worthy goals, right? So there's mm-hmm. worthy goals and, you know, flat goals or whatever, mm-hmm. um, unworthy goals. Um, they're mostly unworthy. Like they're, I just don't care. Or I just, I can't really connect with a character who goes after that. You know, I just don't care. Um, and so that's important. Um, one of the things that I t- teach about, uh, connecting with characters is that not only you have to use this, these techniques to make us, um, you know, feel sorry for him, uh, show their humanity and, uh, show their admirable traits, to just so you care about them, right? Mm-hmm. But the second part of that equation is what do they go after and why? And so in the movie, what do they go after is very important because if if we don't care what they go after, we're just not going to care. Right. We're going to just see them go through the motions and struggle, but we're not going to care. And that's why uh, one of the things that I'm 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 um, uh, I teach a lot about is Pixar because Pixar yeah, yeah. knows how to tell great stories. Oof. And, uh, and so, and, and I go through this whole list of the entire movies and I, and I go and show them what the characters are after. And mm-hmm. if you see what they're after, it's always about, you know, saving a friend, saving a child, falling in love, saving the village. It's, it's all these things that are, that are considered, you know, that goes deeper into our humanity and our, uh, our sense of being social with, you know, being part of this group, as opposed to being uh, a selfish singular person that goes after what they want just to be happy mm-hmm. and you never see that you know if talk about Shawshank redemption you know mm-hmm. uh, his goal was to not to to not to die to, <laughs> not to die right but not to be yeah not to be stuck in this prison right so he was for 19 years he, he planned to escape and he finally escaped but if you look at what is the thing that really makes us completely fall in love with that movie is is the last you know twist. 30 seconds <laughs> no no not not the twist of him escaping uh-huh. oh, because think about it right yeah, 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 yeah. think about it remember it's not Andy's story it's Red's story that's another right. thing to that, that's, right? it's very true so, it is. so if you think about the way the movie ends the movie doesn't end with Andy escaping it ends with Red connecting uh, as a friend with Andy on that beach and uh, right. right, and did you know? And that is the moment that 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 makes us go, oh, oh, right? it's, it's done. It's done exactly, exactly. There, there's actually a very, uh, you know, who Lindsay Doran is, the producer. Yes, yes. <clears throat> so she she's um, uh, she's known for uh, talking about story too. She, there's a, there, I think there's a, a couple of videos online, uh, some TED talks that she did mm-hmm. about the ending of films and how the thing that people uh, really really care about about a film is not the achievement of the, of the character's goal. It's what happens afterwards, which is uh, the ability to share that feeling with people they love. So she mentions Rocky, for example, people think that Rocky, you know, a lot of people think he won the fight, which he he doesn't, but, uh, but they remember that thing when he goes like, yeah, "Yeah, you know, Adrian, Adrian, but that, you know, they think it ends on the fight, but it doesn't end on the fight. It ends with him and her at the end right. and saying, I love you, I love you, right? And she mentions Dirty Dancing, too, about the fact that it doesn't end with with the, with the girl leaping uh, in the arms of Patrick Swayze. It ends with her reconciling with her father. Um, so there's, there's all these, you know, what's really important. I think film and stories talk about what's really important in life. You know, they're kind of like, they're, they're teaching us how to live. They're the, I like to say that stories are kind of like the how-to manual for life. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. And and they're kind of like, they're coded in this uh, in this entertainment form. Because, you know, I mean, people... That's what stories are, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Pe- people can actually tell you how to live, but that's usually, what, you know, like documentaries or nonfiction or, or documentaries. Mm-hmm. But stories are a lot more powerful. Because they're 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 entertaining, but the message is in there. The message, the, you know, they're kind of like subtly telling you how to live, 
by entertaining you. It's like a sugar coated pill. You like know? like myths and legends, essentially. That's how exactly the, yeah. the meat and potatoes of, of our society is passed along. Right. Exactly. So, uh, an uh, interesting note, though, on that Shawshank Redemption, that last scene, from what I understand, was added by the studio. The, the scene about the uh, with Red, in Mexico. Yeah, from what really? I, I I've, I've studied the movie a lot, right? And I've I've watched every documentary ever made, and originally okay. the original script did not have that scene. And how, the, how does the original script end? Do you remember? It ends with him driving. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. Uh, in the bus, going towards Andy. Oh, okay, okay. But it's still, uh, it was, that's fine. That's it was, fine. It, it was, it's still as powerful, I think. I mean, yeah, well. But, but the beach was like, we needed to see it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it was. But it, as long as it's not, that it doesn't focus on Andy, because it wasn't no, Andy's story. No, yeah. it was read on the, on the, on the right. bus, and he just drove off. And then right. if you notice that it, the, the, the helicopter, I think there was a helicopter shot that kind of goes off into the ocean. Right. And then it dissolves into that because that was the end. That was the last shot. And then they put in that the dissolve on Andy on the beach okay. afterwards, which I think with I, I as, like as, studi- I, as studios yeah. notes go, I think that's probably one of the best ones I've ever that heard. That's true. That's true. <laughs> I think that was very powerful. So um, I have a couple more questions for you if you have some sure. time. Um, one. Um, can you explain? And I know this might be a big question. So if you don't have enough time. <laughs> as me, usual. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Can you explain to the audience what is subtext and why is it so important? Ooh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, Carl. If I'm asking, it's too okay. Deep, it's deep funny questions. because you're 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 hitting on the on the questions that I have a whole course about. You know what I mean? Like I teach a whole course on just subtext. So great. So this is a good little teaser. I'll give you the I'll give you the, the thirty second. Uh, that's exactly. Second that's all, yeah, that's all we ask for. Uh, okay, so so subtext. Okay, so I'll, I'll give you an example. Um, so if I if I said to you. Uh, three plus two equals five, and you your mind will go, okay, yeah, I I I I got that. It's pretty obvious, right? Mm-hmm. But if I said to you, uh, or showed you a piece of paper and, and I showed on the board, it said uh, three plus x equals five. Okay, mm-hmm. your brain would automatically start solving x, sure, because you're challenged by it, right? You go, oh, there's a challenge. Oh, ah. X equals two. I got it. I solved this, right? Mm -hmm. So that's a good example of the difference between obvious dialogue or an obvious thing you see, right? Where it's just obvious and on the nose, we call it, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And subtext. because So subtext makes you an active participant in the scene by making your brain work a little bit. So when somebody says... uh, like in the, the famous scene in When Harry Met Sally, when at the end they connect and she says, I hate you, Harry, I hate you. Mm-hmm. And she kisses him. Right. Right. We all know what she really means and feels. Right. We know she loves him. Mm-hmm. So the line, I hate you, is really subtext for I love you. what she really feels. Right. So I hate you plus the kiss equals subtext. And that's really more interesting than a character saying, I love you. And kissing him because then you go, okay, it's, it's obvious. It's just there. So the obvious, and, and that's another, by the way, that's another thing that you see a lot of in terms of, of problematic scripts. And there's, there tends to be very lack of subtext throughout. It's mostly on the nose throughout and obvious. It tends to be a passive experience. So you're kind of mostly bored by it. Because you're not challenged. By you're not challenged by it. Whereas right. when you see subtext, you go, you're like completely engaged because your brain is working. You're like, they're trying to figure this out. Go, oh, I know what she's really feeling. Mm-hmm. Right, you're actually working a little bit. You're ahead of you're ahead of the audience a bit. Yeah, uh, yeah, exactly. As a writer, as a writer, you're ahead as of the a audience. writer, yeah. Well, you want the audience to feel to be an active participant versus a passive one. So, so, and there's actually techniques for that. And and really, the good writers, the ones that get hired all the time, especially in dialogue. You know, you mm-hmm. get the writers who are hired for two weeks to 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 rewrite the dialogue. It's usually to take the dialogue that's just flat and obvious and on the nose, and give it some life. And the life is usually give it some top subtext. Got it. Got it. All right. So one last one last uh, big question. This is just a geek question. This is just something <laughs> I, w- I want the answer to. Uh, sure. Um, because I know you're you know you're you who you are and you've studied so many stories. Um, I'm a huge fan of Breaking Bad. 
Okay. And it is one of those stories that uh, it's obviously not a screenplay, but in the scope of the story and the arc of that character and of the arc yeah. of the show, there's never been a television show ever to do what he did. Mm-hmm. Um, what's your thoughts on how um, Gillian, uh, Vince Gil- Gilligan or Gillian? Uh, uh, Vince Gilligan. Gilligan. Vince Gilligan actually was able to create – like what are the key p- moments or points that made, that makes that story so good? Because unlike, like, like very much like Shawshank Redemption in mm-hmm. the film world, Breaking Bad's one of those shows that I can't say universally everyone loves, but mm-hmm. it is – Pretty well respected and pretty right, well right, right. Well, uh, uh, Breaking Bad is not the only one. I mean, The Sopranos did that too, and uh, The Wire also did that too. I mean, we're talking about and Mad Men. I mean, we're talking about shows that just that took the, that, that was took just the, great storytelling. It's just great storytelling, you know. If you have a show that has great storytelling with great characters and and interesting scenes and surprises and. I mean, I, you know, and I'm a big fan of Breaking Bad too. It was just just a big novel. It was just this oh, novel yeah. that took five seasons mm-hmm. and I don't know how many episodes mm-hmm. um, to tell a story, and it was a complete story. It was about a character that was very interesting, okay. right? It wasn't your typical good guy. Uh, it was just arc, and it just kept us engaged because we wanted to know how that would turn out, and that's really kind of like the key question of stories. Uh, good stories, I think always make you think and make you wonder what's going to happen next. Mm-hmm. You know, if you can have that, that sense of kind of mystery or, you know, JJ uh, Abrams calls it the mystery box, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. So of, talk, of yeah. just, uh, yeah. Um, of, of constantly making the audience want to know what's going to happen next. They're constantly tuned. They're going to keep watching scene after scene after scene. In the case of breaking bad, they just watch episode, episode after episode after episode. Except that one episode you know, with the fly. Uh, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> except that one episode with the right, fly. Right, right. That's well, the that one was entertaining, that, you know. Everybody says, "Like, what the hell? <laughs> did, did the writers just take the day off? They just right, like, let's right. see what we could do with the fly." <laughs> right, well, but it still kept you engaged, though, right? It's, to a it's, certain extent, yeah. <laughs> um. So yeah, as long as it makes you wonder, you know, what the hell's going on? <laughs> what, how, what, is, what is the meaning of this? Or, yeah, yeah, you were uh, just wondering. It just like... keeps you engaged. But that was a, you know, and, and it's funny because I get that question all the time, especially in the sense of, you know, writers are told all the time to make sure your character is likable. Oh, God. You know, it's the biggest note. And, and you know, and they always mention Breaking Bad because, you know, here, here's a character you really connect with who you don't really agree with. Well, in terms of his moral moral part of it, you know, I mean, he's doing something is illegal. But the thing that's brilliant about him is at the beginning you did. He was just a well, at the beginning you did, right? And, and that's the brilliance of it. You you that got is. hooked into him, yeah. And then he turns into Scarface, right? At, but yeah. the thing is, is why do we keep why do we keep loving? Winning, yeah, because, because I mean, if you if you if it's almost like uh, you know if you had a a, a friend. Mm-hmm. And then your and then your friend started killing people <laughs> right. and enjoying it. You suddenly wouldn't become his friend anymore. But you wouldn't st- want anything to do with him. But, but if you but if you cared about him, right? You know that's the thing. So so the the thing is, is there's the lesson in there about making sure you care about that character mm-hmm. and you worry about them. Yep. About what's going to happen, then you then you could tell a good story. That's really the basis of telling a good story and uh, creating a character you care about. And it doesn't have to be it doesn't have to be likable, but you have to care. And I was I was lucky enough to binge watch most of it up until the last eight episodes, uh-huh. and it was I every day my wife and I would just sit and watch three or four episodes. Wow, like, yeah, yeah. It was, it was great. <laughs> I know. Thank God for binge watching. Right? Uh, I know, I right? It's a great, I think it's a better way to enjoy, enjoy story. story because it's a lot more immediate, and you don't have mm-hmm. to wait a week. You know, it's all fresh in your mind. Thank you, Netflix. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. So, where can uh, people find more about you and more about your work? Uh, very simple. They just, all you have to do is Google my name or just put carlyglacius.com and it takes you to my website and you just get to see all my work there. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, I, I, you know, when any, anytime somebody asks me for a business card, I, I don't have business cards. I always tell them just, just go to my website. You know, that's right. my, that's my, my business card right there. Just my name.com. And you have, um, you have a bunch of books you've written. You have a DVD course as well that you sell. Uh, yeah, well, I don't really sell it. It's mostly the writer's store and creative screenwriting. Um, mm-hmm. 
magazine they 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 have the dvds uh, i just basically you know uh they, they, they ask me to do something I, I i don't like to say no so i do something and then they sell it okay. uh same with the teaching uh i teach at uh screenwriters university and at ucla extensions writers program uh both online so uh people can take courses with me okay. uh, i also consult so if anybody wants consultation there's the details on my my website okay and then i appear on uh you know writers conferences sometimes uh you know there's uh um, this year, I'm going to be uh, actually in a few weeks. I'll be at the at a writers conference in uh, San Luis Obispo, uh, where I'm, I'll be delivering a keynote address there. And uh, next year, I've been invited to a, a script conference in Poland, and oh, okay. uh, and then an animation festival in South Africa. So I'm becoming kind of international now. That's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, one last question. I asked this question of all sure. my guests, um, and it's it's a tough question. Ooh. What are your top three films of all time? We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. Wow. And every and everybody <laughs> says the same thing. Oh really? What, what did Everyone they say? Says, I'm wow, wow. <laughs> they just oh wow. Say, wow. Yeah. Well that's a that's a very big question. And it yeah. doesn't have to uh, be in order, just three films that, yeah, in the uh, moment that you can remember. Well, you know, it, well, Blade Runner is is oh, right up there. Yeah. Uh, Silence of the Lambs, oh, wow. uh, Shawshank Redemption, yeah. uh, The Godfather, yeah. uh, anything by Pixar, uh, <laughs> except maybe Cars and Cars Two. Those are the, the I think those are the two weakest uh, films. But but in terms of story, um, uh, you know, we just I just watched Up uh, last night with oh, my kids. So, so uh, you know, and I've seen it a hundred times. So it's kind of you know it always gets you. Uh, they just know how to tell great stories. So, so uh, anything by Pixar, um, and and there's one movie too. It's a kind of an well, I won't say obscure because it's 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 a it's a classic masterpiece, but a lot of people don't know because it's it tends to be an, an old film. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that's uh, Charlie Chaplin's uh, City Lights, yeah. uh, a movie called City Lights, yeah. uh, with where he falls in love with a blind girl, and mm-hmm. that that's one. Of, it, you know, it's probably uh, one of the earliest uh, romantic comedies, uh, but but very very moving. That's Especially the last—that's silent, that's the silent last, if I remember right. It's silent, yeah. yeah, yeah that's a silent uh, film. Uh, but it—it's it, known for the very last uh, scene in the movie, which is one of the most powerfully emotional film, uh, you know, scenes in the world in the history of, of cinema. Mm-hmm. And they always show that they always show that clip or that moment uh, in in every every Oscar telecast about you know the, the you know the the history of films and stuff <laughs> right. like that. So very very powerful uh, and, and and pretty entertaining film. So I would say that's that's right up there with my. Uh, uh, top favorite movies. Very good. Good list. A good. Yeah. List. Thank you. A thank you, list. Carl. Thank you so much for being on the show. We really appreciate it. you. Gave us a lot of great gems. Uh, great. Out here. So hopefully, uh, glad to do it. it. Was my pleasure. As promised, Carl brought the thunder and brought some amazing knowledge bombs. So Carl, thank you so much again for being on the show and dropping some major knowledge on this episode. Now, if you want links to any of Carl's books courses, anything about we talked about in this episode, just head over to IndieFilmHustle.com forward slash BPS007. That's Bulletproof Screenplay BPS007. And guys, if you're enjoying the show, please don't forget to subscribe on iTunes and leave us a good review and give us a five-star review if you really like it. It really helps us out a lot and gets the word out to help other screenwriters on their journeys. So just head over to Screenwriting Podcast. Dot com. And that is a end of another episode of the Bulletproof Screenplay Podcast. Thank you so much for listening. And as always, keep on writing no matter what. Talk to you soon. Thanks for listening to the Bulletproof Screenplay Podcast at BulletproofScreenplay.com. That's B-U-L-L-E-T-P-R-O-O-F-S-C-R-E-N-P-L-A-Y.com. 